Hey, history nerds. It's my favorite time of the year, as you all know. We are deep into fall and onto the cusp of winter, and everything is right in my world. It's also my least favorite time of the year in a way because it's my birthday season, but I also love it because it means I get to pull rank, which is what I'm doing for sure with this episode, as I found a topic that I'm super excited to sit Kat down for story time with since it's about someone related to a historical figure that she knows very, very well. Wait, who are you doing? I'm very confused. I'm trying to figure out which historical figure I know very, very well that I haven't already talked about. Like... I said related to a historical figure that you okay, know very, related, very well. Related. You've actually already okay. talked about this historical figure. Oh, amazing. Is this okay, somebody who's wait, related to Mary them? Shelley, oh my god, isn't Mary Shelley, are you doing her mom? Because no. Because if you're doing her mom instead of me, I'm going to be upset. I am not doing Mary Shelley's mom. So yes, as you guys can tell, I've kept this a secret from Kat. <laughs> I'm so confused. <laughs> and so I'm hoping that she does She does not know this story. We'll find out in a second. Um, so yeah, but as we mentioned before, we're still working with Greenleaf Geek Dice, and hopefully you guys have had a chance to check them out and are loving the products like we are. Christmas is coming up, so make sure to look for any gift ideas for the nerds in your life, even if they're not gamers. Dice are just great ways to settle any arguments over anything. Sometimes my husband and I are like use our dice to miss make decisions for us when it comes to what we want to eat for dinner or just what board games to play. So you guys can just make a numbered list of whatever it is that you get decide on and roll the die. The more fun I'm the dice is, the more fun the chore or activity <laughs> might seem. <laughs> Absolutely, I'm not gonna lie. I've definitely done this with my to do list as f before when I have when I've had a hard time prioritizing what I need to do. I will just write everything out. Also, fun workout tip. If you're like me and you're an absolute noob when it comes to like taking care of your body, I say as I'm actively sick. Um, <laughs> yeah, a fun little workout game that I've done for myself before was I would roll a dice or roll a die to decide what workout. Like I'd like pre-plan like how many rep, you know, how many reps and sets and whatever. But like I'd roll a dice to decide what workout to do next when I, because I don't know, I don't know what I'm doing, and this just kind of makes it more fun than just guessing. <laughs> I mean, it is definitely you know, a lot more fun, especially when you have dice involved. Like, I'll even use it for if I can't decide what kind of, like, what book I want to read. I'll just pull out, like, a pile of books and roll the dice and see what it is. Listen, um, some of us are indecisive. Some of us get decision fatigue. That's okay. That's what dice are here for. <laughs> exactly. So, check out Leah's website. Use our code WDYKA podcast at the checkout for 10% off your order. There's a ton of fun dice. There's a ton of stuff she has on sale constantly. So just take a look. Where uh, The link is also in our show notes. Just honestly, go support Leah. She's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So mm. then the more serious stuff, fair dude's warning for this one. We're going to be talking about murder, scandal, sex, witchcraft, and basically child abuse in today's standards in a way. <laughs> Which historical figure are we talking about? I'm so confused. <laughs> Please remember that we are a history podcast. The events of today's episode happened in the 1600s when was their idols Paris? were a lot different, when their ideals oh. were a lot different than ours. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, fair enough. Good, good. Yeah. <laughs> um, I warning. do know that the majority of you are understanding of that, but just in case any of our new listeners are new to this world of history, keep this in mind, s'il vous plaît. <laughs> yeah. As soon as you said 1600s, I'm like, pirates? But no, I don't think it's actually pirates, because, like... No, there's no pirates, yeah. unfortunately. But it's the 1600s. It's prime time for pirates. There's no pirates. Dang it. Okay. All right. So, Kat. <laughs> yes. Are you ready to learn about the Countess of Somerset, Frances Carr? Yes. Who are they related to? I will get there. I'm so confused. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, mm -hmm. Francis was born on the 31st of May, 1590, to Catherine Nivet and Thomas Howard, the first Earl of Suffolk. Okay. Yes, oh, she is related like... to that Howard family. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, like... Okay, yeah, no, it all makes sense now. Okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm here for this. I get it, I get it. I get the connection. So this family tree it's is, related. like, freaking insane. So technically related to Catherine Howard as well as Anne Boleyn then, because they yes. are cousins. Yes. Oh my god, okay. It's all, it's all coming together. 
So following this family tree to get like her exact relationship to Queen Catherine Howard was like a whole freaking task in itself. But long story short, her great grandfather, Henry Howard, Earl of Surrey, was the first cousin to both Anne Boleyn and Catherine Howard. Oh God, okay. Family trees are not my thing. I am going to have a hard time figuring this out. But okay, yes, so okay. So Anne Boleyn so was first cousin to Catherine Howard. Yeah. Henry Howard of Earl of Surrey was first cousin to both of them. So basically they're just okay. all cousins at this point. Okay. <laughs> Um, so his name is usually associated with the poet Sir Thomas Wyatt, and he was arrested, tried, and beheaded for treason against Henry VIII a few years after Catherine's beheading. Okay. King Henry swore that the Howard family was after him, which apparently they were, as Henry of Surrey is said to have asked his widowed sister to become Henry's mistress and then used that influence to help raise the family rank. Wow, okay. That sister said, hell no, I'd rather kill myself, fell out with her brother, and then testified against him along with pretty much the rest of the females in the family to have both Henry of Surrey and his father tried and killed for treason. Oh my god. So apparently the Howard women are not to be trifled with. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Okay. So, this, so that was her great-grandfather. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Her grandfather was Thomas Howard, 4th Duke of Norfolk. Okay. Yes, he was executed okay. due to being part of a plot against the crown. Oh my god. <laughs> this just keeps happening. This time, he was going against his own blood, as he was the second cousin to Queen Elizabeth I, and he was convinced to take part... Um, in the Rodolphi plot to free Qu Mary, Queen of Scots, so that she could take the English throne and restore England to being Catholic. Wow. All right. Now, here's the fun part. Uh-huh. Thomas Howard had been trying to court Mary after losing his third wife. Okay. Because So this feels like it's more of a personal thing than a religious thing then, but under the guise of a religious thing. So I think it was kind of a mix. Okay. Okay. Um, because marrying Mary would have given him super political status. Oh, totally. Even if she was thought to have been involved in the murder of her second husband. Oh my god. Okay. Which, that's a whole thing that I think we should probably get into Mary Queen of Scots at some point, but... Yeah, that's, that's going to happen, yes. That's... Um, <laughs> the marriage was supported by many Catholic nobles, and a revolt was planned, but when it was clear that it, that was going to fail, Thomas tried to stop it. Okay. Which, of course, would gain him some clout. Uh, yeah. Um, it was too late, though, to stop that plot, and Elizabeth had him arrested. There wasn't enough evidence, and so he pleaded his cousin's, like, for his cousin's mercy, and so he was released, and he went straight to try it again. <laughs> oh my god, dude, I'm gonna need you to learn. Um, unsuccessfully, of course. So she wasn't going to be burned twice by her second cousin, and he was beheaded as the first nobleman to be executed during her reign in 1572. Oh my god, okay. So the later Howard family did not learn from their past at all. I, uh, all right. And this is only in Francis Howard's line. The rest of the Howard family, no better. <laughs> And I'm only covering so, okay. Francis's line of the Howard family. Like, the Howard family, in general, just fucking things up left, right, and center and being power-greedy assholes. That's so, like, <laughs> it's almost genetic at this point. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, it's almost like they can't help themselves. They cannot. <laughs> That's so wild. Okay. Um. So I'm literally just covering Francis's line of just crazy bullshit that they're doing to keep their power i mean honestly good because i don't think i'd be able to keep it straight any other way there's so many people doing the same things over and over again <laughs> now we're coming to her mother and father mm -hmm. so catherine nivet or the countess of suffolk as we shall call her to avoid confusion with the best catherine was the <laughs> lady in waiting to the queen consort of england and of denmark for a time 
At first, she had a place in Queen Elizabeth's bedchamber and was deemed the Keeper of the Jewels in 1599, Mm -hmm. keeping this title as she transferred to Anne of Denmark until 1608. That is a hell of a job title. Right? Just imagine writing on your resume, the Keeper of the Jewels. Like, that's so, (laughs) like... I love it. I love it so much. Um, So when Anne gave birth to Princess Sophia, um, the Countess of Suffolk was so highly regarded that she would have been her godmother if the poor child had not died in infancy. Mm. But she still wanted even more power. Mm. So when Lord Thomas, her husband, was given the title of Lord Treasurer, his lovely wife, still looking young and beautiful used her husband's position and her string of suitors to extort kickbacks from all of her lovers. Whoa. I mean, that's a way to do it. Right? Unfortunately for her, though, she came down with smallpox in 1619, and it, quote, spoiled that good face of hers. Wow! That's, uh, yeah, that is, um... Holy, that is a way to think about a human being. That's... Yeah. Yikes. That's just yikes. Yeah. So her husband was also being caught at the same time for his own misuse of the royal treasury under his title. (laughs) Oh, no. So, like, I mean, so he's embezzling i'm assuming then pretty much like, yeah something along those lines yeah. pretty much an old-timey embezzling but no his wife has got to go because her face doesn't look so pretty now <laughs> well her like so basically i think they're in Polly and cahoots together like mm. he's embezzling his way she's kind of embezzling her own way <laughs> oh, okay. and stuff right where probably if she hadn't gotten smallpox and her face oh, had been then she okay. would have probably would have like, the, her lovers probably would have been a little bit more lenient on her. Oh, I see, I see, I see, I see. She, it's, it's easier for her to get away with. Yeah, because I mean, because... beauty is going like, the beauty of a woman. You're more likely to cover up her misdeeds. Yeah, all her, all her stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. I see, I see. So I get it now. I Lord get it. Thomas... It's still, it still sucks, but I get it. <laughs> yeah. Lord Thomas was arrested and put to trial the same year that she had smallpox, uh, mm-hmm. resulting in her own misdeeds being put into the spotlight as her lovers fell out of love with her and realized exactly what she had been doing. <laughs> uh-huh. Both Thomas and Catherine were found guilty and banned from court. Though yeah. the, Fow- the Howard family names stayed extremely prominent and powerful somehow. So they're like, okay, so they found them guilty. Yeah. They were kicked out of court, but also we're still going to let you... Be powerful like, families, relations. basically. <laughs> oh my god, okay. That's, uh, yeah, that's, yeah, that seems wise. Yeah. So this brings us back to, like, Frances herself. Now that we know about, like, her family issues. Mm-hmm. So as per the time, Frances was fairly quickly married off around the age of 14, to a 13-year-old boy named Robert Devereux, who would be the third Earl of Essex. Okay. Devereux came from a very high family, as his grandfather was the personal secretary to Elizabeth I, and was considered to be her spy master. Okay. It was mainly a political union, and the two kids never actually lived together. Okay. So, when young noblemen come of age in, like, the 1600s, they would go on a grand tour of Europe and be shown off at various courts to start making, like, their political and social connections. Okay. So, Robert was sent on this tour as soon as he came of age, having never consummated the marriage with Francis. Wow, okay. So, but back then, that was, like, a you could still get an annulment if you didn't consummate. Like, that's, like, a big deal. Yeah. So... I bet that she was relieved to not have had to, like, lose her virginity at that young of an age, as I said before, like, child sex, <laughs> like, well, yeah, child, ma- totally. like, like, childhood marriage, like, you're basically being sold off into marriage, in, essentially, like, in today's ideal, like, idea, right? Yeah, yeah, by today's standards. Yeah. yeah. How, sorry, how old did you say she was again? She was 14, and he was 13. 14 and 13, they are both babies, like... yeah. I, I will say, 
even like given the context of like what was considered normal back then i am a little bit relieved to hear 14 and 13 right. rather than like 14 and 32 like yeah you know yeah so when robert came so weird. back mm-hmm. from his tour smallpox was running rampant through europe as we know mm-hmm. with francis's mom <laughs> well robert also caught smallpox oh the young girl not surprisingly avoided her husband with a vengeance <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> However, she had also fallen in love with another man. Oh. Robert Carr, the first Earl of Somerset. Okay. So Carr was three years her senior, which luckily, as we've just said, is not too much of an age difference in what we usually see at this time period. Yeah. But here's the bonus. He was a favorite of the king. Ooh, status. Robert Carr was Scottish by birth, with his last name being Kerr originally, but changed to Carr to be more English when he got to court. Okay. He started off as a page when he met Thomas Overbury, and the two became best friends, traveling to London together around 1601, as Overbury became Carr's secretary. Okay. So Carr was the charismatic personal friend who rose to fame. Well, Overbury was the brains behind the duo, being the secretary and advisor. Okay. Um, it was in 1607 that Carr caught the attention of King James the Fourth slash First. Whoa. Um, since he was Big the dude. fourth of Scotland slash First of England. <laughs> yeah. So we're just gonna the call James. him the Fourth slash First. <laughs> I'm gonna. I'm gonna track or i'm gonna sidetrack for a second the king james's listen i remember digging into it a little bit when i went down my uh macbeth for the macbeth uh episode yeah i was talking about like the curse of macbeth and you were talking about like uh cursed horror movies and one of the king james's was in that story like about surrounding like the the weird things about the original macbeth and witchcraft and all that jazz it is so confusing right Having a king be, like, the sixth and also, like, the third. Like, it doesn't make sense. It makes zero friggin' sense. It doesn't make sense, and it's hard to follow, and it's, like, the like the timeline, the family tree gets so muddled so fast. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, that was my tangent. Feel free to continue. (laughs) But no, so yeah, it was in 1607 that he caught the attention of King James the fourth slash first when he snapped his leg during a tilting match which is basically a form of jousting. Um, And the king was taken by the young man's talent that he showed before the accident. Basically like, hey, you were so great before this happened. Unfortunately, you (laughs) broke your leg. I am now in love with you myself. You did great, kid. (laughs) Yeah. So soon, King James knighted Carr and even gave him a manor house using a legal loophole. As the owner had made a flaw on the will, which made the manor property of the kings upon his death. (laughs) Whoa. Okay. So basically the king was like, oh, hey, look, this guy made a little bit of an issue, like made like this one tiny error, and now it's mine. And so I give it to you, sir, good sir. (laughs) It's kind of a huge flaw. Like, that's... And so this poster... This man's family literally was like fighting for this land the whole time Carr had it. Oh my god. That's so unfortunate. <laughs> like, I'm sorry, but like, I'm like, great gift, but <laughs> there's a wow. bit of an issue with this gift because now I'm dealing with this shit. Yeah, that's so like, oh, wow. Um, but no, so Carr's influence on the king grew to the point that he could even convince the king to dissolve parliament in order to stop them from attacking the king's Scottish favorites. Which I'm like, I mean, if you can convince the king to, like, literally just stop parliament in general. Yeah, I mean, that's some good influence. That is some hefty influence. Yeah. (laughs) That's no small deal. So, in 1611, he was made Duke of Somerset and then Privy Councillor. The next year, King James's Secretary of State passed away, and Carr was given the duty of Acting Secretary. Ooh. This also put him in dope. direct line of work with the Howard family and completely entangles him with them. Yeah, no kidding. Okay. But now let's just go back a little bit to just before this entanglement. 
Um, mm-hmm. As Francis has just a tiny bit more story to tell, because she's still married, remember, to her smallpox ridden young husband that she still hasn't had sex with. Right, yes, that's still grounds for annulment. Okay. Um, so there is a tale that sh- at this time she has decided to seek the help of a woman who went by the name of Cunning Mary. <laughs> okay. The story is that Frances offered Mary a diamond ring in exchange for a solution to her marriage. But the woman took the ring and never followed through on the so-called solution. Okay. The whole thing came out when Frances accused Cunning Mary of theft at the same time as her father and uncle started the process of getting her marriage annulled on the grounds of it being unconsummated. Oh, okay. Yeah, so that makes things very complicated. Luckily for Frances, no one took Cunning Mary's accusations seriously as the old woman was just a folk healer against one of Britain's most powerful women. And the old woman actually had the diamond ring in her possession without any other proof of Frances's involvement in a plot to kill her husband. So she's just kind of making stuff up. So it seems. So it seems. So it seems. I mean, yeah, like, so somehow this old woman had this diamond ring in her possession... And so this woman saying, well, no, like, I was given this ring as payment, basically for a poison to take care of this man. I yeah. decided not to give her a poison, though. Yeah, okay, so I mean, like, from per- from everyone else's perspective, I mean, no, like, she's just making stuff up. Like, like, from everyone no else's perspective, like, she's actually... making stuff up. But And then Francis is saying, well, no, this woman stole this ring from me. Yeah, 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 okay. Right? But at the same time, because at this time, women could not make... The annulment, uh, like, couldn't start the annulment process. The right. men had to do it, so her father it's and uncle husband. had to start this yeah. process for her. Oh, her father or uncle could do it? Yeah. Okay, I thought you meant, like, the 13-year-old husband had to do it, and I was like, I don't no. know that. Like- no, so her father and her okay. uncle started this process to be like, hey, look, okay. we want this marriage annulled. They have not consummated. It's been years. Like. Yeah. Yeah, let's get this out of the way. Let's get this out of the way. We would like to marry her off to somebody else. He's incompetent. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) But let's keep this... Like, But let's keep this tale in mind for later. So, while this mini-scandal was averted, a larger scandal was taking place with the annulment process getting started. Right. So, for a woman in the 1600s, it's an extreme violation of her privacy as she is pretty much laid bare for the entire court to ex- inspect her literal virginity claims in this particular Ugh. case. That makes things uncomfortable. So, okay. Frances claimed that she made every attempt to be available to her husband, but that he never consummated the relationship and therefore it should be null and void and she should be free from the marriage. I mean, once again, he's 13, she's 14. Like, well, they're a little bit older now. Well, now, but, um, you know. But we already know this to not be fully true, since she clearly avoided him when he returned from his little tour due to the smallpox, even right. when he wasn't contagious. Okay. So, right, that's right, okay. Um, but, it wasn't, but it was enough for the so next step to happen, though. with 10 okay. matrons and two midwives fully examining her body finally deeming her hymen to be fully intact. Ugh. And that's such... Uh, okay. That's not an accurate way to tell anything, just for the no. record, so that every all of our listeners know that tells you nothing. That's it not tells you literally nothing about anyone. It like, tells you nothing. It, it means nothing. Just going like, horseback riding can be enough to break a hymen. <laughs> in modern terms, riding a bike, putting in a tampon, like, it yeah. doesn't, like... Uh, most girls don't have it by the time that they have sex for the first time. Like, like it's so, yeah. like, they're not, like, don't have it, but most girls don't have it intact by the, by yeah. the first time that they have sex. Like, that's just not an actual thing. Like, And some uh, people, like, after having sex a few times can still have it intact because it just depends as yeah. to how thick and durable your particular yeah. hymen is. <laughs> Oh, exactly. Like, it's so, it's such an unreal, like, it's not, like, no doctor would actually, no doctor worth their salt would actually be, like, would be okay with, like, telling someone for sure that someone is a virgin based on that. Like, there's, it's such a, like, ah, it's such a pet peeve of mine. Yeah. (laughs) Every time it comes up, it's such a pet peeve. 
Well, just like people didn't, but people didn't know any better back then, and people were like dumb about that kind of stuff. So, like, well, and people just, back we then were just as dumb as we are now. That's true. There with are rumors that, right, that flying kind of around, people. as Frances is said to have been veiled through the whole process in order to keep her modesty intact. Mm-hmm. So the court immediately was like, another woman was substituted for her in the examination. Wow, what? So not only is it not good enough that they're using this bogus method to ensure that she's a virgin, but also even when this young girl has subjected herself to be inspected by, I'm assuming, men. Well, 10 matrons and two midwives, so it would be 12 women. Yeah. Oh, thank God they actually let the woman do it. Possibly. Well, there might have been some, like, there's probably at least one man in there because credibility in that time. (sighs) Totally. But, like, even still, this poor girl subjected herself to be inspected by, like, a room full of adults. And, like, and even then, all the other adults were like, no, this child probably is, isn't is a virgin and still probably had a body swap. Like, yeah. even then, it's not good enough. Like, what's the point? What is the point? Yep. Well, I'm they even so... started a little saying that was spread around the court. Oh, no. Oh, no. And it goes like this. <laughs> This dame was inspected, but fraud interjected, a maid of more perfection, whom the midwives did handle while the knights held the candle. Oh, there was a clear inspection. Uh, They turned it into a nursery rhyme. (laughs) Welcome to the 1600s. I'm losing my mind. That is like the most... Like, this is a meme of the 1600s, and it's over whether or not this child is a virgin. Like, I'm so, like, I don't know how to process this information right now. Oh, just wait. Why would you do this to me? Because it's fun. Oh, my God. And it gets worse. (laughs) Of course it does. Because not to be held responsible for the lack of sex in his marriage... (laughs) The fact that's, that's even a sentence you have to say. Robert of Essex did what every man should do in this situation. I'm, I'm extremely ready to hear something that literally no one should do in this situation. He went around court and basically at every possible moment when the conversation should deem it worthy to do so, he'd whip out his penis to show off he was far from impotent. It wasn't that he couldn't have sex at all. Of course not. It was only Francis who made it impossible to have sex. Oh my god. And Kat is basically falling out of her chair at the moment laughing at this. (laughs) He is literally said to have even gone up on a table in front of his friends to whip it out and show it. How old is he at this point? How old is he? Like, between like 16 and 18? Oh my god. And that's his best reaction. That is the most teenage boy shit I've ever heard. No, I can have sex. See, look, watch. Like, I don't mean to see it, Timmy. You're okay. Oh my god. <laughs> like, I can't. And people just let him. No one told him to stop. Like, I. No! Like, oh my god. Was everyone high that entire time? What is happening? Well, because then apparently when his Uh friends and even the judge questioned him about it, he gave them the only possible reason. She was a curse and there was some sort of satanic involvement that had to be dealt with before literally anyone could possibly think about having sex with her. (laughs) At one point, it was even suggested that Robert of Essex should go to Poland to ensure that any possible curse she might have put on him was removed. I'm gonna cry. I'm gonna cry. That's just... I'm I'm not trying to make light of this. This is a really awful, horrible situation, but it's so fucking absurd. I can't. I can't. Like, I don't know. Like, Like, can you imagine being in this court during this and just, like... Watching this guy just whipping it out and being like, I'm being cursed by this woman. (laughs) The 16 year old child whips out his dick in front of everyone 
to prove that he can have sex and then goes on to say that he can't have sex with her because he she cursed him and people just believe him after he's been flashing everybody for god knows how long and yeah. so just it couldn't just be oh we're not we don't have any chemistry. Oh, we're just not attracted to each other. It couldn't... No, he had to jump straight to witchcraft. Yeah. Because he couldn't think of any other explanation. Like... Well, look, he had to look just, good still. I'm just not attracted to her? Like, is that not... Like, no, how does well, that not in this time frame. Way? That's just it's calling It's the 1600s. Her like, I don't understand. Like, mm, Like, mm, <laughs> I'm suffering. I am suffering. <laughs> this is just like the most ludicrous. Like I'm just, I'm just astonished. I'm like, I don't know, I don't know how to process any of this. <laughs> so <laughs> he just went straight from jerking off in public to witchcraft, and that's not a sentence I ever wanted to have to say. <laughs> like I'm so like, like he, this kid. Like this kid is just fueled by extremes. Like there's there's no middle ground for him, like whatsoever. No, like, there's not. About, like, well, like her first thought was trying to get him murdered. Her second thought, when that didn't work, was maybe I'll try to get it annulled. Like this whole situation is just every extreme. It just seems like someone just used a dice to just randomly generate this story. Like everything that you're about to say, I whatever you're about to say next, I have no idea. Like I don't know where this is going from point to point. Like I'm so. Like, well, I'm just I'm dying. Like <laughs> the whole annulment was a mess and a half. Yeah, you don't say. <laughs> the he said she said was insane. <laughs> And it was on the verge of being refused by the regular laws. It, like, on, I, don't, I don't know like, what to expect from them either at this point, to be honest. But, but it's like, you kids are insane, figure your shit out. Lest we forget, Francis mm. and Robert Carr were lusting after each other. Right. And okay. Carr had one very, very, very influential man on his side. Right. King James okay. stepped in and granted the annulment between Francis and Robert of Essex on really? September 25th, 1613. Just like, in time literally? for Francis, Francis to be able to marry Robert Carr on December 26th of the same year. Literally, what is this? Like, this <laughs> sounds like a fan fiction gone horribly wrong. Like, I don't understand. It's basically just a Wattpad story. <laughs> like a Wattpad story it sounds like Francis is your name like you know what I mean like I'm like I can't like, like how did we get here how did any of them think that any of this was a reasonable idea like I'm just like oh I need more tea hang on well now we have our happily ever after right how is okay yeah Right? Uh -huh. Right? Sure. Yeah, we have our happily sure. ever after. They fought so hard for this. So they did. I hope this ends well for them. They did. But here's the thing. Oh. <laughs> uh, uh huh. Someone close to Robert Carr really, no. really wasn't on board from the start. No. Sorry, our little friend Thomas Overbury was suspicious of the Howards from the start. Because they have a family history of trying to overthrow people and murder people and do all kinds of crazy shenanigans. So, like, yeah, can yeah. you continue? So, Overbury told his friend that he didn't think getting involved was a good idea. That oh, even don't. just being with Frances was a bad idea. She was already seen as immodest. So, and that wouldn't be helpful for Kara's personal image with the rest of the nobility if he's tied with the Howard family on their continuous decline no matter how much power they might still have. I, uh-huh. Which, honestly, Overbury, kind of smart. <laughs> kind of has a point. Kind of has a point in this climate, yeah? Just, yeah, a, yeah. Just, just, just a little bit of a point there. Just a, it, it is a bit of a point. It is a bit of a good point. And even, like, disregarding, like, family power and stuff, this bitch is crazy. She tried to have her husband killed. Step one. Well, they didn't believe that. 
<laughs> Nobody believed still. that. Don't even still. Don't even still. Okay. <laughs> Car, fully stupid in love, relayed Overbury's concerns to Francis, who, of course, relayed them to her family. That is the most, like, that is number one what you are not supposed to do. Well, what did like, I say if earlier? Like, if someone's like, hey, 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 I'm really concerned for you. I think that you're in a really dangerous situation. You don't go and tell the person that you've been warned about, hey, someone still thinks you're dangerous. What do you think? <laughs> yeah. Well, like, when what did I say earlier? Don't fucking mess with the Howard family, folks. Especially the really? women. Ah, uh, this is not going to end well. This is not going to end well. Well, apparently Overbury did not get the memo. Because then he even circulated a poem of his own writing all about the virtues of a woman that a man should demand of his wife before he, in a rash manner, decides to marry her. I'm sorry. He basically did a what? fucking Hamilton. My dude. <laughs> I, um... He did a fucking Hamilton. Okay. <laughs> Cat. Uh-huh. Yep. <laughs> Yep, that's, yeah, yep, that's pretty much it. So, Frances okay. took it upon herself <laughs> to duel Overbury. She full-on dueled? With words over this slight against her, attempting okay. to manipulate him into outwardly speaking ill of Queen Anne of Denmark. Whoa, <laughs> that's a big allegation, honey. Queen Anne? Absolutely pissed about the disrespect from Overbury because the idiot took the fucking bait, allowed him into court with very strict rules. He was not allowed to be anywhere in her sight, nor was he allowed to be caught alive on her side of the royal lodgings. Holy shit. This was a huge blow to his court image, but it did not stop there. It kept going? It kept going. Oh, no. This is a family that is just, like, vengeful. Like, they're, like, like you think Taylor Swift can get revenge? Are... The Howards were doing it long before <laughs> Taylor Swift. We have got to stop using Taylor Swift as a comparison for things. This is going to get dangerous for us. No, I think Taylor Swift would actually be like, I'm, I'm with you guys on this. Like, this woman knows what the hell she's doing. You I'm. Know, a... you know the gift? Do you know the gift of, like, where she's at whatever award show it is? And the then guy's like, yeah, be... yeah, yeah. When, she... when he's like, um, be careful if you get in a relationship with these girls, if you break up, they will write a song about you. And she just goes, like, yeah. <laughs> like, shrugs her shoulders. Yeah, like, like that's she, all like, I have in my head right now. Like, Matt, like, like, like I'm pretty like, sure that, right like, now. she could easily put Taylor Swift's mastermind on top of the Royal, on top of the Howard family. <laughs> like, you know what? Like fitting, the Howard fitting, women, would, just, would... like specifically, could get ma like could have Mastermind as like their theme song. <laughs> oh my god! Oh, we're gonna get in so much trouble one day. <laughs> okay, so knowing that Overbury was against their daughter's marriage and still had influence over Robert Carr, the Howard family men used their current status to suggest to King James that perhaps Overbury would be useful in a new posting as the ambassador to Russia. To Russia? To Russia. So they're like, just ship the dude off. Pretty like, much. Get him out of here. <laughs> but they knew that he, that Overbury would refuse the offer as it would mean leaving his dear friend's side. Okay, which would lose him standing in the court. Therefore, it was the perfect plan to get him completely shunned from high society. Ooh, completely shunned. It worked all too well. <laughs> Overbury mm -hmm. refused the king's offer, and James immediately threw him into the Tower of London on April 22nd, 1613. Again with the extremes. Again with the extremes. Like, we think that he'd be a really good ambassador of Russia. Of all places, Russia. And then he's like, no, my buddy, my friend, I couldn't possibly leave him behind to the Tower of London with you. Like, yeah. Like, there's no middle ground in anything that has happened so far. No. Like, no one has explored the middle ground. Everyone's going for the nuclear option every time. Like, no. Because by September 14th of the same year, 
Overbury was dead. Holy shit. Like, I shouldn't even be surprised. I shouldn't even be surprised given what I just said. And yes, this is all before Francis and Robert actually got married. They're not even married yet. No, because remember, they, the, the annulment happened on September 25th, 1613. Right. And then they got married December 6th. 26th of the say of that year uh-huh september 14th is when overbury was found dead he was such a possible problem to their actual marriage that the howard family were literally getting out of the way before the annulment was even completed holy shit <laughs> like they were like just in case the annulment goes through no, no they were like we're then. making sure this annulment goes through this marriage will go through you are a problem you're out of here <laughs> Oh my god. Like, okay, so the couple gets married and they live a long and happy life because they work their asses to get off to get here. Well, People died along the way and they never split up and they were perfectly happy together, right? That's how this story ends, right? Sure. Oh my god, no. Would you like to end here and that's how you believe that the story ends? It might be better for my peace of mind, but I do actually want to know the truth. Well, okay. Nobody questioned Overbury's death in the tower until 18 oh. months later, in the summer of 1615, when an assistant to an apothecary in Yorkshire made, a, made an astounding confession on their deathbed. They admitted it? The assistant said that they had been paid £20 by the Countess of Somerset for poisons to murder Overbury with. The man got paid 20 pounds and was like, yeah, a person could die for this amount of money. For 20 pounds. Yeah. I mean, at that time, that was a fair amount of money. I don't care. <laughs> As I will tell you, not next episode, but the episode after. Twenty. Okay, but 20 pounds is like... 20 pounds like, is a like lot a, of money. Like a lot That is of money. more, like, so... Like a couple grand? Like, that is, how much? Well, okay, so 20 pounds would be about two years wage for a librarian. So, so like, what, like a hundred thousand? Yeah. A hundred thousand? Okay. Also, I love that you put it in reference of, like, a librarian's salary. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so, like, so, like, a hundred thousand dollars? Okay, that's a lot of money. 20 pounds would money. get you a eight-volume Bible at that point. <laughs> okay, that's... Mm, Which that is the is equivalent of, of t a year's salary for a librarian. Yeah, I mean... Well, two years' salary for a librarian, technically. Right. So, like, if we're thinking along the terms of, like, this is the equivalent of, like, a two years', two years wages paid for you, paid to you in cash. Yeah. All at once. That is kind of a life-changing amount of money. Yeah. Uh, okay. That, like, obviously, murder not okay, cool motive, still murder, but, like... <clears throat> But yeah, okay, I can under I can understand how that could become like a hitman level of temptation, you know what I mean? Yeah. So the new full time secretary of state to King James took this information to the king in September of sixteen fifteen, and the Privy mm -hmm. Council was urged to investigate. So a trial and investigation took place, revealing the truth to Overbury's few months in the tower. Okay. The lieutenant of the tower, Hellwise, finally admitted that he had been told by Overbury's keeper, Richard Weston, that Francis had bribed him to poison Overbury's foods. Hellwise had then started to intercept any foods that went to Overbury in order to avoid any more poisonings from happening. He okay, had not taken enough. any action against her because of the family's influence, and because her great uncle was his own patron, so his livelihood was literally at stake if he said anything. Whoa. Yeah, fair enough. So, the killing dose was snuck in by Frances herself in a smuggled oh enema laced with mercury chloride. Mercury chloride. chloride. Those are two very deadly substances. And I love, like, I love hate that she's like, no, no, no. I've got to get my own hands dirty with this one. Like, she's so ready to kill people. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, so an enema, for I'm those like of that. you who don't know, is a liquid injected into the lower bowel by the arse. 
And also, like, how was she allowed to do that? Like, that's well, like a personal... I don't even want to know, like, how she knew that that was happening that day and why that procedure was being done to him. Thank you very much. Also but that is literally point. how he died. <laughs> that is also a good point. Like, I don't even like, want to know how she knew it was happening and why it was being done. Like, ew. And no one, and no one thought to, and no one thought to, like... So I'm pretty sure that it wasn't that she went in and he just bent over for her. Like, yeah, right? like, like this is my thing. Is that like, it's not like this girl's not like a nurse, right? Like, as no. far as we know. So, oh, God, like, no. why, why was she the one to administer it? And if she was the one to administer it, then why did no one think that this was suspicious at all? Like, this is kind of very obviously a huge red flag. Like, I think that she probably went for, like, in so many reasons. just like replaced what like the actual like baster that was going to be used for it okay so she didn't like administer it herself, i don't think she administered she, like, it, herself. it herself she probably just swapped it out right like so she okay, just smuggled okay, it okay, in okay. and like probably swapped it out or whatever but i'm like yeah which makes a little more sense but like but i'm like how did like how the hell did she know that, that was ha- like yeah like how did she know that was yeah unless uh, that was like a tor- like a torture method that they were doing i don't know well i like that was like not an uncommon treatment to use enemas for things but like yeah i just i have a lot of questions i have a lot of questions like like she seems to know like way too much yeah so both francis and robert were arrested in october of 1615 with multiple Mm -hmm. others arrested for being accessories to the murder between october Mm -hmm. and december of 1615 helwyn and weston were hung for being accomplices along with francis's waiting woman ann turner and the apothecary james franklin the assistant was already dead because it was on his deathbed that he so he just did it himself (laughs) he was like i'm already dead um yeah fair enough francis Uh admitted her guilt to the murder while robert swore his innocence in the whole plot he okay. was found guilty for accessory to murder, however, as it was found out that he literally burned as many incriminating documents as possible and bribed people to cover up Francis's involvement. Ooh. Yeah, that's at least accessory. Like, dude, if you didn't do that, then you could have gotten away with it. Yeah, like, that seems, yeah. But, I mean, I mean, they worked so hard to get them married, I don't think that they wanted to be split by prison time. <laughs> right? Um, so at first they were both sentenced to death, but then due to their close relationships to the king, it was downgraded to life imprisonment. (laughs) Connections, oh my god. Even with that, Francis received a pardon from King James in 1622 and was released from the tower. Robert's pardon took a little longer than that and he was released in 1624. Oh my god. So they basically just get away with it, like... Yeah. Oh, my word. Yeah. Um, like, well, all things considered, because, like, you know, clearly someone just died in the tower and, like... Yeah. For not wanting to move to Russia, I might add. Pretty much. Like, <laughs> yeah. Well, he had slighted the king. Like, you don't say no to the king. Uh, I know, but, like, that ego, though. <laughs> um. So, while imprisoned, Francis and James had one daughter together. A- her, her name was Anne. Anne okay. basically broke the Howard curse in a way by living a life free of major scandal. Oh, good for Anne. Though her husband's family was against the marriage at first because of her family past. Yep. No one is surprised here. Luckily, though, King George I was for the marriage, and she lived happily with her husband and eight children. Okay. One of her sons, however, took back on the family trait of being an issue for the noble society. Of course, of course. Like, I don't, like, yeah, of course. <laughs> um, I was waiting for the other shoe to drop and you, you, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah, so he fine. took okay. part in the Rye House plot and ended up being beheaded for treason just one year before his mother's death. Oh it's said that his treason and the shock of it all is what caused Anne's death as her health almost immediately declined and never recovered. Wow. So yes, your children can be the death of you, apparently. Quite literally, as a matter of fact. Yep. So Francis only lived for another 10 years after being released from the tower, passing at the age of 42, and then Mm -hmm. Robert passed 13 years later. Okay. 42 and 13 years later. Those are are some pretty decent old ages for for that time period. That's not bad. Um, So yeah, 
And that's the story of Francis Howard slash Francis Carr. Literally every sentence you said. Like, I didn't know what to expect. So, like, that was just so well done. Well done. And now you can see why I was just like, I am so excited to just yeah, blow your yeah. fucking brain with this. <laughs> well, Ashley's been telling me for ages, like, Kat, we've got to do this. Kat, we've got to do this. I need to see your reaction to the story. Like, we've got to do this. And I've been like, okay, okay, okay. Like, what could possibly be like this, like, you know, this, this exciting? What could possibly have you this enthralled? Yeah, I get it now. <laughs> <laughs> Like, just every piece of this was just wilder than the next. Like, I don't... Right? One, oh, like you broke me. Honestly, like, finding sources for Francis definitely required me to look her up by both names. Um, mm. So I do recommend to any listeners, if you want to do any more reading up on her, do the same. <laughs> yeah. Look her up yeah. by as both Francis Howard and Francis Carr. C-A-R-R. I do have a pile of links in the show notes to the various sources that I use, which are also great historical sources. Um, and yeah, and like, hopefully I haven't ruined the Howards too much for you, Kat. But they're hey, freaking Howard insane. Howard is insane. She had nothing to do with this. She was the part of this family. family. She, was, she was literally part of being used to gain... Being... Yeah, no, she was absolutely used to gain status, but that's not her fault. No, it's not like, her fault. She was... Yeah... She was definitely young, like. But if she had, if She's she had, if she had lived, imagine what she might have done <laughs> in this family if she had lived to. longer. <laughs> uh, okay, yeah. what? I mean, I, I'm actually now really friendly. curious as to like what mastermind shit she might have gotten up to. I I've got no idea, man. Like, she also had a bit of a mind of her own too, though. Like, that's what I'm meaning. Like, Francis yeah. definitely had a mind of her own. Oh, totally. I'm totally. like Francis a word duel. Like, who would have thought? Like, like, who would have thought to have literally like somehow get some like get some like get this guy to freaking diss the fucking queen <laughs> like, <laughs> out loud really, in front of other people? Like, really? Like, I, like yeah. she's cunning as fuck. <laughs> well, absolutely, absolutely, like. She is completely unhinged. Don't get me wrong. Yeah, I don't know, man. I don't know. <laughs> but don't worry. Next episode, I'm actually going to ruin one of my favorite historical people for everybody, possibly. Is it someone related to Anne Boleyn? No. Because that would have been really fitting. We're going even further back in history. Ooh. I, believe. Well, I mean, technically, Anne Boleyn was further back in history, but you know what I mean. Oh, no. <clears throat> what about actually around the same time? But we're going no, I mean, like a different, like a whole different country. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. I meant further back than Cat Howard, but yeah. Yeah, whole different country. Actually, even around the same time as Cat Howard. Okay. Um, yeah, very diff- like very similar time frame to Cat Howard. Still, well, you know, same time frame as um as Francis, just different country. Okay. Cool. Yeah. All right. So yeah, we'll see you guys all. Next time on the weird side of history. Hopefully slightly less weird next time. Anyway. Not happening. (laughs) Bye.